Finally, your vacation has arrived. And it's completely fine that you didn't book a hotel that accepts pets. Your beloved dog will be fine staying home with a random dog sitter. What's your dog ever done for you? Let you be the big spoon? Doesn't say anything about the shocking amount of selfies you take at home. Uh Uh-oh, your favorite pets. Wow, he ate them whole. When a vacation from your pets isn't an option, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we offer pet-friendly accommodations. Hilton, for the stay. I'm starting today's show a little differently. By introducing someone who is part of every episode, but whose voice you don't typically hear. Why don't you just introduce yourself? Tell me who you are. My name is Joanne Levine. Uh, Right now, I'm the executive producer for Slate What Next and uh, Slate What Next TBD. Um, But I am also someone who's a mom and a daughter and a caretaker. Tell me a little bit about your mom, as much as you want to share. Sure. Um, My mom. Uh, My mom, uh, growing up, was this vibrant woman. She was a woman of a certain generation in the 50s who was someone that wanted to be a lawyer. And her father said, no, you if you're going to go to college, you're going to be a teacher or a nurse. So she did that. Um, but she was of the generation that was marching in the streets for women's rights. Um, and I grew up with her telling me, you can do anything you want to do. You can be any anyone you want. And Uh, You can be a mom, you can be a professional. Um, And yeah, so that was who my mom was. She was this vibrant New York City dynamo. Um, And I would say about 10 years ago, we, we really, actually more, gosh, 12 years ago, we really started noticing that her memory was slipping in a profound way. Joanne's mom, Eileen, has Alzheimer's. And as with most people with the disease, the path to that diagnosis was not linear. First, she struggled with memory, then slightly more complicated cognitive stuff. When my daughter was five, she's now 15, so yeah, it's more than 10 years. Um, We were playing Uno, uh, which is a very basic card game. It's not that hard. My daughter at five used to beat us all the time. And my mom, without my stepdad at her side, could not do it. Joanne's stepdad was protective. And she says, in denial about what was happening. Then, three years ago, the wheels came off. My stepfather died very suddenly. And we took her to a neurologist. And the neurologist said, look, she's got all the signs of Alzheimer's. The one thing that was very clear and that I've been able to hold on to as this disease has ravaged her brain um, and ravaged her mind, but not her soul, is that she knows me. It's some tiny comfort in a process that is brutal. A process that includes the night that Joanne's mom got lost. An aide who was caring for her agreed to take her for a walk and went to get a coat. She comes down and my mom is gone. So we had the New York City police with my aunt, my mom's younger sister, looking for her, my brother driving around the Upper East Side in New York City. And my aunt asked the police, how often do you find people? And they were like, sometimes. Joanne was four hours away in Washington, D.C. And all of a sudden, I get this call. And this is after an hour and a half, I mean, and not making any headway. And this man answers and says, is this Eileen's daughter? And I said, yes. How do you, who are you? And it turns out she went back to the apartment complex where we were, um, where we had sort of grown up. And she was wandering around. And my mom was always someone that presented. She, she had style. She wore really great clothes, but she was wearing slippers. And it was like below 20. And the security guard who said his mom had Alzheimer's, looked and said something's wrong. And in all the time that Joanne's mom has been sick, there have been no real medical game changers. Until last year, when the FDA approved a controversial drug, but one with only mixed clinical results. At this point, even its manufacturer has all but abandoned it. 
now there might be another medication on the horizon, but only for people in the early stages of the disease. Joanne knows that for her mom, it is likely too late. I just wish... I just wish there was more. I wish there was more progress, you know, and it's it's science. I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. I don't pretend, but it just feels like, you know, I'm hopeful that maybe we are on the cusp of something that finally there there will be a breakthrough that leads to other breakthroughs. But for someone that has been sort of shadow dancing in this world for about 15 years, medically, there's been nothing. Today on the show, why it's taken so long for Alzheimer's patients and their families to get any relief, and whether a leading theory of the disease is to blame. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick with us. The General Insurance is partnering with Black Entrepreneurs Day, an annual event curated by businessman and investor Damon John to celebrate Black business. The event will feature conversations with game-changing entrepreneurs, special musical guests, and an NAACP grant sponsored by the General Insurance awarded to an up-and-coming Black entrepreneur. Black Entrepreneurs Day will stream live from the world-famous Apollo Theater in New York on October 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. See BlackEntrepreneursDay.com for more. When a patient like Joanne's mother is having cognitive trouble and doctors finally get to the point when they mention the A word, Alzheimer's, there's not actually that much that medicine can do. The spiel hasn't changed very much in more than two decades. That's reporter Damien Garday from STAT. He covers the biotech industry. There are medicines that are approved that are now generic that can in the short term, basically boost memory is what they've demonstrated to do, but they don't actually slow or arrest the progress of Alzheimer's. There's by no means a cure for the disease. So it's very much setting in motion a plan for a given patient and their family members and caregivers for how to cope with this kind of unavoidable decline. For the past several decades, most of the research into finding a real cure for Alzheimer's has focused on something called the amyloid hypothesis. The idea actually comes from the German doctor, Alois Alzheimer, who the disease is named for. He was investigating a 51-year-old woman who died with what he called pre-senile dementia in the early 1900s. In 1906, Alzheimer wrote that upon autopsy, the woman's brain had, quote, severe disease process of the cerebral cortex. He found that her brain tissue was filled with plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And over the ensuing decades have we come to understand that those plaques and tangles are the result of a protein called amyloid, which in healthy function exists in the body for reasons we don't entirely understand, but in the brains of patients confirmed to have Alzheimer's disease, it appears to tangle up and form these plaques in the brain, which are thought to be toxic, are thought to destroy neurons and synapses and thus drive um, the Alzheimer's disease symptoms that we recognize. But this is where things get tricky. There isn't much debate that amyloid plaques are in the brains of people known to have Alzheimer's. The question is what role they play. There's a compelling theory that, you know, as I said, these these plaques are toxic and they're destroying neurons. And thus, if you could design a drug that would clear these plaques out, you would prolong, you know, the healthy function of a patient's brain. There's also a theory that actually whatever's causing Alzheimer's disease is upstream of these plaques. And so the plaques themselves are more like scar tissue, or, Hmm. you know, I've heard people put it as they're the gravestones of the neurons, not the killers themselves. And so to clear them out of the brain, you're just doing some kind of custodial work that maybe doesn't have that much of of an effect on patients' brains. So while this debate has played out, billions of dollars have been spent by drug companies dating back to roughly the mid-90s, trying to build a functional mousetrap, basically, a drug that would clear these amyloid plaques and, you know, that where what's really important, and that would, in a large clinical trial, actually do better than placebo at keeping patients scoring better on these questionnaires of cognition and function. And, you know, I mean, we can, we can dig through some of the history there, but the vast majority of those studies have ended in failure. Name a drug company, and there's probably a failed Alzheimer's medicine in its history. 
Elon, Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, and Roche are just a few. But Biogen gave patients a glimmer of hope with Aduhelm, a drug that it began developing in 2014 along with Japanese company Asai. Early clinical results in 2017 indicated that maybe they had finally refined the process for targeting amyloid. It appeared to not only clear amyloid from patients' brains, which is pretty easy to confirm through brain scans, but also seemed to have like a dose-dependent effect on how well they did on these scores of cognition and function. So stock price booms, everybody's really excited. Biogen, deciding not to waste time, goes from, that's a phase one study, immediately to a phase three study, which is where they were enrolling thousands of patients in two identical studies and basically saying, like, let's just pedal to the metal, we'll get these data, these will support FDA approval. It's a long process, it's an expensive process, so they skipped phase two, which is usually what people call like the proof of concept study, the point where you kind of test drive a phase three trial before really investing in it. Because of the immediacy of the disease and the promise of the drug, Biogen decided, let's just go straight to the hard part. But phase three did not turn out like Biogen or the Alzheimer's community had hoped. So cut to 2019, we learned from Biogen that they're actually discontinuing these two studies. They, they're independent data monitors, which are people who, every clinical trial has this, they're people who get to look at the unblinded data, basically to make sure it's safe and to make sure that the drug is, has a hope of working so that you don't throw good money after bad. Those people told Biogen, actually, it's the latter. You, you are throwing good money after bad. We've looked at the data hmm. and we conducted what they call a futility analysis. And we've concluded, based on lots of mathematics, that futility is the most likely outcome. Stock price crashes. Everyone, wow, we thought this was going to be the drug that works. Lots of sturm und drang, rending of teeth, gnashing of garments, calls for resignations. I mean, this was like a huge deal in this world. It was crushing. But then something even more unusual happened. Biogen took another look at one of its studies and decided that it did work. Patients on Adjuhelm outperformed the placebo by 20-odd percent on certain tests. The right people on the right dose at the right time was enough for the company to try to get approval from the FDA. Damien says the neuroscience community was skeptical. The real shocking part came uh, last year when we learned that the FDA agreed with Biogen and decided that this drug did merit approval. But what's curious is Biogen had filed for a full approval, which is basically they asked the FDA to weigh the evidence of whether taking Aduhelm is likely to delay the effects of Alzheimer's compared to placebo, the final data, the clinical data. But that is not what the FDA did. It granted Aduhelm accelerated approval, a program designed to get medications for serious diseases to patients based on what's called surrogate data a sort of data breadcrumb trail. So for example, if it were a cancer drug, the hard data would be, do patients who take the drug live longer than patients who don't? The surrogate data would be, does it shrink tumors in the short term? So the FDA has often approved cancer drugs based on that because yes. it's pretty reasonable to say, if you're shrinking tumors, you're going to live longer. Doesn't always happen, but you know we can see the kind of breadcrumb trail there. Now, in this case, the FDA approved it based on data that it cleared amyloid from the brain as a surrogate to that must mean that patients who get the drug will do better than those on placebo. But as we mentioned, you know, the notion that clearing amyloid from the brain helps people remains a relatively controversial idea. So more teeth, more garments, more controversy that the FDA made this decision. Um, People in neuroscience, I mean, there were resignations from FDA advisory panels. Right, three experts who were on one of these FDA panels quit. Right. There was a panel meeting in which those people tore up Biogen's case for this drug being approved and really kind of turned their attention on the FDA itself, which at that point was showing signs that it was amenable to Biogen's logic. Hmm. So once the approval actually happened, then, you know, all hell broke loose in neuroscience. I mean, this is a relatively small community and these people don't swear very much on the record. But in as far as, you know, anger is, is expressed in like academic publications, this was about as much as you could expect. Another big kind of wrench in all of this was when Center for Medicare and Medicaid refused to, to cover Edgehelm under Medicare unless you were in a clinical trial. That to me seemed like the government saying like, this drug isn't worth it. Basically, yeah. And it was kind of shocking because traditionally... Um, CMS defers to the FDA as to whether a drug is 
good. So typically they will cover any FDA approved medicine according to the label that the FDA agrees on, because that's just sort of the separation of powers, I guess, in in health and human services. What was striking about CMS's decision with Aduhelm is that they implicitly and somewhat explicitly said the FDA was wrong to approve this medicine. I mean, this this was really the death blow for Aduhelm as a commercial entity. There had been arguments over the price of the drug. It cost a tremendous amount of money, right? It was rolled out at a list price of $56,000 a year. The issue was basically Medicare looked at that number and said, we don't see a value proposition here. And that was particularly debilitating for Biogen because Alzheimer's disease is a Medicare population in this country. It predominantly affects people who are elderly and something like 75% is an estimate of the potential Aduhelm customers would be covered by Medicare. So that really tanked any possibility the struggle would be profitable. And then furthermore, a lot of private insurers had waited to make a coverage decision deferring to CMS. And once that, you know, kind of guillotine dropped, then they had an easy way to say, well, we're not going to cover it either. And they could just defer to kind of the 800-pound gorilla of government payers. What did all this mean for people who had been taking it or had been really excited about the potential for a new medication? I think it was confusing and and in some cases devastating. I talked to a couple people who were in the clinical trials who insisted that they felt like they had experienced a benefit being on the drug. I know there was disappointment with the price that that Biogen chose to charge. I I don't think anybody in the patient or physician community defended that. But also, it's important to remember, there is just such desperation for anything that might work here. And there's no waiting. Every day is a day that conceivably you are less yourself than you were yesterday if you have Alzheimer's disease. So I think people in both the patient community and the clinician community just feel just kind of a whiplash with like being told that this is promising, being told actually there are these caveats. Yes, it's one approval. No, you probably can't get it. And your physician is telling you that honestly, maybe it wouldn't do anything for you anyway. What a, I can't even use the word actually that I would want to use. You know, and it comes on the heels of decades of these false starts. I mean, this one actually resulted in FDA approval. It was the first FDA approval for an Alzheimer's medicine in about 20 years. But, you know, patients are plugged in and the internet, we all have access to it. So, you know, when you talk to someone in the Alzheimer's community, you're quite often talking to someone who knows much more about the travails of given clinical trials and scientific studies and seemingly promising medicines than you do. When we come back... After high hopes and crushing disappointment, maybe, possibly, there's another drug. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds, anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to write anything from a book or screenplay to just a letter. Improve your communication skills with your boss or your family. You can learn how to make a dinner worthy of a Michelin star or just how to make really good scrambled eggs. With over 150 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. Explore lessons in any order you'd like, across your phone, tablet, Apple TV, computer, and on the go with audio mode. Lessons of approximately 10 to 15 minutes in length fit easily into your everyday life. In addition to video lessons, Masterclass provides you with downloadable lesson recaps and supplemental materials. For example, cooking classes come with beautiful downloadable guides that are at the level of a high-end cookbook. Get unlimited access to every class, and as a What Next TBD listener, you get 15% off on an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash TBD now. That's masterclass.com slash TBD for 15% off Masterclass. Hi, it's David Plotz, co-host of Slate's Political Gab Fest podcast, and I am very excited to announce that we're doing a live show in Atlanta on Wednesday, November 2nd. Please join me and Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson at Georgia Tech's First Center for the Arts for a great night of political discussion, debate, and fun. Slate Plus members get an exclusive discount, so if you're not a Slate Plus member yet, this is a great time to join. Go to slate.com slash GabFest Live right now to get your tickets. They're first come, first served. Again, that's slate.com slash GabFest Live for more information and to buy your tickets for our November 2nd live show in Atlanta at Georgia Tech. We'll be streaming it too. 
So if you can't make it in person that night, fear not, you can join our virtual gathering instead. Slate.com slash GabFest live. After this huge drama, there is maybe a new contender on the horizon. Tell me about Lacanamab. Meanwhile, as we're all, you know, distracted by this slow-moving disaster that is the commercial rollout of Adjuhelm and, and the, you know, corporate upheaval that it resulted in, you know, resignations and firings at Biogen, there has been this backup molecule, for lack of a better term, this other amyloid-targeting medicine that Biogen and its partner, the Japanese pharmaceutical company ASI, had been developing simultaneously. This kind of thing happens, I guess, in the drug industry quite often, is just trying to share the risk of how difficult it is to develop new medicines. Lecanemab had always been perceived as kind of the, I don't know, younger sibling with maybe a little less promise to Adjuhelm, hmm. in part because there was, they, ASI did run a phase two study, the step that Biogen skipped with Adjuhelm, and the data were a little confusing. They tested multiple doses. I remember very well, this was 2018. They unveiled it at a big Alzheimer's conference, and the result was a lot of head scratching. The data, I mean, someone described them to me as uninterpretable because some doses seem to do well, higher dose seem to do kind of less well. There were disparities between the placebo group and the treatment group such that the observed benefit might have been statistical noise. And so coming out of that, I think there was a prevailing sense that lecanemab was a less promising shot on goal than Adjuhelm had been. And yet, <laughs> uh, earlier this year, we got the press release from ASI, which is leading the development of lecanemab, saying that it succeeded in a phase three study of its own. Basically, it did what Adjuhelm didn't do. Because if you recall, the evidence that Adjuhelm eventually won FDA approval with was not a clean success. It was sort of half a success that required you to kind of squint and turn the paper upside down to see what the company was seeing. And at least as far as we know, based on this press release, that's not the case with Lacanumab. They met the primary endpoint of this very large phase three study. Patients who got Lacanumab did 27% better on cognitive tests than those who got the placebo. But there are some important caveats. This trial focused on early stage disease, and all the patients had some degree of decline on what's called the clinical dementia rating. It's an 18-point scale that determines cognitive function. Zero means you have no signs of cognitive decline. 18 is severe dementia. In practical terms, the trial meant that patients who got the drug did about half a point better on the scale than those who didn't. But according to Damien, it's difficult to conceptualize what all this means in real life. So the debate immediately among clinicians is, well, what is, what is half a point on the CDR scale over the course of 18 months? Does that mean someone who might have had to give up driving doesn't or, or does so, you know, less quickly than someone else? Does it mean it's easier to have longer conversations, recall the names of grandchildren? Like, it's, it's difficult to tie these sort of conceptual numerical outcomes to the everyday lives of people with Alzheimer's disease. There's a pretty good study published, I think, last year or two years ago, where researchers looked at thousands and thousands of patients' medical records and talked to the physicians who administer these scores, basically asking them, what is the smallest difference on the CDR that you would classify as a clinically relevant difference for a patient between checkups with them, basically? And there's a range of answers. People generally said between 1 and 1.5 points. That's really where it's like, oh, I can tell this person is, has worse dementia than the last time I saw them. But the minimum, when they kind of extrapolated all the data, was about 0.5 points. So that would suggest that this drug is kind of doing the bare minimum that clinicians would say would actually make an observable difference in someone's life. And remembering the names of your grandchildren, God, that's a big deal. Right, exactly. It could be. And, and that's the difficulty is extrapolating large clinical trials. It could be something as meaningful as that for one patient. It could be something totally imperceptible for another. And then the other caveat here, and this is just the way the business is done, we are working off of a press release about the results of the lecanemab trial. The company will present much more detailed results at a medical conference in November. But until then, you know, everyone you talk to kind of inserts that caveat pretty quickly in the conversation of saying, well, we're going off a press release here, but... 
we really focus this conversation on these two drugs, but I wonder what else is out there? Like, is there anything else kind of waiting in the wings that feels promising? So that's a great question because lecanemab was really the initiation of a nine-month period that promises to transform how we think about Alzheimer's disease. So as we mentioned, that phase three study, at least on the top line, was a success. Within weeks, we will learn the top line results of another phase three study from another anti-amyloid antibody, this one from the company Roche. I mean, we're going to find out basically whether lecanemab does indeed herald a new era where people have figured out how to attack amyloid or whether it might be a one-off success. So there's a situation in which over the course of about 12 months, we find out that three anti-amyloid drugs worked to varying degrees, potentially. And I mean, that would truly change everything for, for patients and for physicians and also bring up a lot of health economics things. How will we pay for all of these drugs, et cetera? But conversely, if the lecanemab data don't look as good as they sound once they're presented in full and these two other drugs fail, we could be kind of having a different conversation about where the state of the art is in, term, in terms of developing new medicines for Alzheimer's disease. I think that over the past two years, right, a lot of us have become like armchair experts in trying to read clinical trials because of COVID and and various COVID vaccines and treatments. Um, And I wonder, when you talk to people in the Alzheimer's community, do they think that lecanemab is a game changer? Do they think it is possibly something that validates the amyloid hypothesis because it it does go after amyloid. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, cautious optimism is such a cliche, but unfortunately it's the only phrase I could think of to describe it. As to whether it affirms the amyloid hypothesis, I think for people who were skeptical, they would say, well, we've always known that amyloid had something to do with the progress of Alzheimer's disease. Like I said, there are debates as to whether targeting it is too late, whether targeting you know different forms of the protein is the right way to go. I was talking to neurologists trying to game out, you know, what difference on the CDR would make you want to prescribe this? And of course, nobody would, I could never pin anyone down. But in order to temper expectations, I heard people saying, you know, a small difference might be the best we can expect from an amyloid targeting medicine based on everything we know, all the failures past. But that's still reason for optimism. One, because for patients, anything that might delay the effects of the disease is positive. But two, there's, you know, a lot of the history of drug development suggests that the first medicine for a given disease often kind of sucks. And these are my words, these are not theirs. But in HIV, in hepatitis C, in cancer, the first medicines were often relatively effective, usually pretty toxic, um, but desperately needed because there was nothing else. And the way history has played out, especially in in virology with with HIV and, and hep C, these are now viruses that can be tamed, basically, and and transmission can be halted with medicines, and it's a combination of medicines. So the the standard of care for HIV, for example, is a multitude of antivirals that basically attack the virus, wall off the virus in different ways, such that even when it mutates, it can be controlled. There's a very optimistic future in which lecanemab, if in fact it's FDA approved, will be kind of like that first HIV drug. We'll look back on it and say, woof, you know, remember when we had such blunt tools? Because what will evolve is a multitude of medicines that target Alzheimer's disease from different angles such that we have a better handle on it. ASI has applied for accelerated approval from the FDA, which could come in January. But after the Adjahelm disaster, Damien says doctors and insurers will want to see more data. A larger question raised by lecanemab and adjahelm before it is whether focusing on the amyloid hypothesis in Alzheimer's disease and pursuing drugs based on it has given researchers tunnel vision or crowded out other promising ideas. I think it's just inarguable that if not for the field's dogmatic adherence to the amyloid hypothesis, we would be further along in Alzheimer's research. We would have more to offer patients who have this disease. And so, you know, putting all of that, keeping all of that in mind while looking at this drug, which is a product of the amyloid hypothesis, ostensibly a product of that dogmatic focus, it's kind of bittersweet because we probably wouldn't have lecanemab if not for that. But, you know, what would we have? 
there are really promising theories about neuroinflammation playing a role in, in how Alzheimer's disease works. It's been tied to different pathogens, including bacteria and viruses. And there's really interesting data showing that if you have, for example, like gingivitis, you are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, which people are still unpacking. But some of these theories have existed for decades, and they seem to take so much longer to reach the point of being, you know, interrogated in a real way. And, and that's where people point to, like, you know, would we be 10 years further along in either confirming or dismissing some of these other theories, if not for the focus on amyloid? It's very hard to listen to this and not think about Joanne's mother and how any drug in the pipeline now is unlikely to give her any relief. But maybe there's a chance it'll help someone like her in the future. Where does all of this leave patients and their families? I'm trying to think of exactly where to start because Jesus Christ, you know. Um, there is this hope. Again, we're going off of a press release, but this medicine does appear to at least slow the decline of Alzheimer's disease, which can only be good news for patients and their families, provided they can access the drug. But I think it's important to keep in mind the field and, and the drug industry has focused on early-stage Alzheimer's disease because that is the population in which it seems like you can make a difference with at least the interventions we know about. There are about 6 million people in the United States with Alzheimer's. Maybe 1 to 1.5 million fit into that early-stage category. So if you have even moderate dementia or severe dementia, science doesn't have anything to offer you right now. In the pipelines of drug companies, even you know some of the more speculative stuff that you might read about in medical journals, I mean, this is where a lot of the frustration with the, the amyloid cabal comes with, is that when you talk to people in neuroscience, quite often they are MD-PhDs, which is to say they publish papers, they do clinical research, they spend time talking to reporters, but they also spend a lot of their time in examination rooms with patients and their families explaining, as we were talking about before, what the diagnosis means, what the prognosis is. So they, I think they're very, very well in touch with the frustration and with just how devastating that moment can be. And I think they balance that in their minds when they talk about a potential new medicine that even if this, even if lecanemab turns out to work as well as the company says it does, we're still leaving behind the vast majority of patients with Alzheimer's disease. There is still so much more work to do. And in contrast to, like I said, oncology or virology or some of the other areas of medicine where we've seen truly like revolutionary new drugs, I mean, Alzheimer's is just nowhere near that. Damien Garde, thank you so much for talking with me. Thanks for having me. Damien Garde is a reporter for STAT covering the biotech industry. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Tori Bosch. Joanne Levine is the executive producer for What Next, and we're thankful to her for sharing her story. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family, and we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you are a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. You'll get all your Slate podcasts with no ads. All right, we will be back next week with more episodes. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening.